welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And today we are so excited because we are going to be joined for our general discussion by a special guest, and that special guest is none other than Vanessa Zoltan. And so that's going to be after our parlor, after our synopsis, she's going to come in and we can't wait to share this discussion with you guys. But if you don't know Vanessa, she is the host of many fabulous podcasts, including Harry Potter and the Sacred Text and Hot and Bothered, which is a podcast about writing romance novels as sacred practice. And she did that podcast kind of in partnership with Julia Quinn. She's also the CEO and founder of Not Sorry Productions, which produces those podcasts. And she also runs pilgrimages and walking tours, exploring sacred reading and writing. And she also has a book coming out soon. We're going to talk all about that uh, later. Yes. uh, But today we are going to be talking about A Rogue by Any Other Name by Sarah McLean. Yes. And fun facts for our author fact, we have talked about Sarah before. However, Bombshell, the book that's coming out in August, has a cover, and it is Cecily Talbot's book. So if you don't know about the Talbot sisters, there's still time for you to get on board, because they're great. They are great. And the cover... I mean, the name of the book is Bombshell, so I think you can imagine the cover. It's great. Give it a Google. You're going to be happy. So I also brought a history fact for us today. I love a history fact. I know. So our main character loses everything he owns that's not entailed over one hand of cards. And that card game that he was playing is French, and it doesn't... It isn't pronounced the way that it looks on the page, but it's Van Teun or something like that. And I did not realize until I Googled it that actually it's just 21. Yes, um, I have Googled it previously to figure out what these games are. And I was like, what is this game? And they're like 21. And I was like, oh, it's literally 21. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, but I'm going to give you just a real quick little snippet about it. So 21, formerly known as Von Teun in Britain, France, and America is the name given to the family of popular card games of the gambling family, the progenitor of which is recorded in Spain in the early 17th century. The family includes casino games of blackjack and pontoon, as well as their domestic equivalents. 21 rose to prominence in France in the 18th century and spread from there to Germany and Britain, uh, from whence, from whence, what, what language this <laughs> Wikipedia article had, from whence it crossed to America. Known initially as Vante Un in the, all those countries, it developed into pontoon in Britain after the First World War and blackjack in Canada and the U.S. in the late 19th century, where the legislation of gambling increased its popularity. Excellent. I had no idea that they called it pontoon in Britain. I only know it as blackjack or 21. Well, we all learned something today. Excellent. So today our main tropes are Hades and Persephone, marriage of convenience slash ruination, the spinster and the rake, and the attractive dowry. We haven't talked that much about that, but that's such a trope that comes by all the time. Like there's a horse or a piece of land attached to the dowry, and that's what makes it happen. And that is a major plot point in this book indeed. Okay. And our main characters are the Marquess born. Michael. His name is Michael. He's mainly referred to as born. Yeah. There's some things with that. And (laughs) Penelope Marbury. So before we get into our synopsis, I just want to mention that our synopsis is a bit short this week since we're going to be joined by Vanessa for a lengthy discussion. So that's why it's a little shorter than usual, but maybe you all will enjoy. I hope you do. So shall we get into it? We shall. Once upon a time, there had been a very confident young man, one with good looks, enormous wealth, a fancy title, and a ton of luck. But luck, of course, runs out. And his did, over one hand, of Vinteun. Oh yes, he had been goaded into it, pressured gently by those he trusted most to wager more and more, until he put everything he owned that wasn't entailed into the pot, confident because he never had reason not to be. But one hand of cards had played him right out of his everything, and he had handed it all to his father's best friend, Viscount Langford, the friend who had helped Bourne run his estate after his father's untimely death, who was also the father of his best friend, Thomas. 
it was an excellent life lesson, and it provided the penniless Marquess of Bourne with a purpose at least. Revenge. The years passed, and somehow Bourne had landed on his feet, and then some. Through hard work and with the help of some excellent business associates, he had built a staggering personal wealth and reacquired much of what he had lost that night so many years before. But one thing eluded him, the land that surrounded his entailed estate and family home, Falconridge. Yes, he was a part owner in The Angel, one of London's most exclusive gaming clubs, but that was work. Falconridge was his home, his history, and though he may not have been the man he was when he had lived there, he would have it back. But Langford knew how much Bourne wanted Falconridge, and for years he had kept it far from Bourne's grasp. But now it's time for us to meet our heroine, Penelope. It's been four years since she's had an offer of marriage, and at 28, she's more than on the shelf. She's had a few unsuitable offers through the years, but her first engagement had ended in scandal when her promised duke cried off to marry a slightly unsuitable woman. But Penelope had it minded, for she could see they were terribly in love. Perhaps she should have minded, though, because after that, she didn't think she could settle for a marriage with anything less than that. But she's 28 now, and realized that her chances of that were quite low, and her chance of marrying was dim as well. Enter Thomas, her neighbor and one of her best friends since childhood. When he proposes, though, it's anything but romantic, as he says, let me protect you, and let's make a go of it, shall we? Penny knows she should say yes, but she doesn't. She requests time to think about it. She finds out later that day that her father has won the Falconridge lands in a hand of cards, and he's attached those lands to her dowry. Suddenly the, quote, let me protect you makes sense to Penny, as many men will clamber for the chance to own the land that Bourne covets. Penny doesn't know Bourne, but she did know Michael. She, Thomas, and Michael had grown up running over the Falconridge lands as their estates abutted each other's. And so, knowing her life is about to change, Penny goes for an evening walk over to Falcon Ridge to remember. She loved that land, but not like Michael did. She felt that the land should be returned to him, but her father hadn't agreed. Her walk isn't as restorative as she hopes it would be. It's winter, and it's dark, and someone else is there. Her emotional cycle through fear to elation to sadness when she realizes it's born, who she has missed so much since the last time she saw him. But he's not Michael anymore. He's a hardened shell of a man who, after some bantering, promptly absconds with Penelope slung over his shoulder into his estate. He tells her that she's made it too easy on him. A night alone with him in the manor house and they'll be married in the morning. Penny knows that he won't relent, but she does know that she doesn't have to accept his terms. So she bargains her placid assent for her sister's futures, two of which are still unwed. She will marry him, he will get the land, but they have to pretend that their marriage was about more than that, so the scandal is squashed and her sisters still have the chance of a happy marriage. Bourne agrees. Penelope, though, wants more from her night of ruination, and Bourne doesn't mind helping out in that regard. And very early into her book, we get encounter number one, which is a trip under Penelope's skirts. The next morning, they are found by Penelope's father, who comes blundering in with his rifle, shooting at the castle. Begrudgingly, he sits down with Bourne later to negotiate the marriage terms and brings with him something so unexpected that Bourne is caught off guard. It's a letter, and it's proof of an indiscretion that will ruin Viscount Lankford. It's exactly what Bourne has been looking for for so long. He had begun to think Lankford devoid of anything of the sort, but here it was, and it was his, if... He re-entered society and helped the last of his two daughters find suitable matches. Bourne couldn't believe his luck. He had already promised the same to Penelope, so it was easy for him to make the deal. Their marriage starts off rocky and continues that way. The two have heat and history, but Bourne's revenge and a few secrets stand in the way of their happiness. Their story is one of learning to trust and learning to let go. There are many, many ups and downs as the two fool society that they have a love match and then coolly distance themselves at different times. And as we know, this is a romance, so they get there in the end. Bourne realizes that he wants to share his life with Penelope, so he sets about wooing his wife. Unfortunately, by that time, he's already pushed her away so many times that she can't quite trust him. So it takes many gestures and some time before she believes he's honest, not just in front of society, but when they're alone, too. The story is full of lots of gaming innuendos, a fun romp under a stained glass window, and finishes with our heroine standing up and betting and bluffing spectacularly for our hero's honor. 
And they lived happily ever after. And there is no epilogue. Well, the epilogue's just book two. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's it, because the epilogue just starts with book two, which is great. Anyway. Yes, but we're not here to talk about book two, and I can't wait to share our discussion of book one. So shall we first adjourn to the parlor? We shall. Today, we are honored to get to promote the Earl, a girl, and a toddler in the parlor. That's right. One of our most anticipated novels of the year is now available. So to refresh your memory, Vanessa Riley has infused the ballroom settings of Regency England with hints of Demerara Island and Jamaican flair in Rogues and Remarkable Women, her series revolving around the Widow's Grace, a secret society of widows battling society to regain their money and a chance at love everlasting. In this sweeping, swoonworthy second installment, a shipwrecked woman searches for her memories and becomes entangled with a conflicted nobleman who holds more answers than he realizes. Masterminded by the ton's most clever countess, the secret society The Widow's Grace helps ill-treated widows regain their reputations, their families, and even find true love again, or perhaps for the very first time. And if you do not know who is in this second installment, let us refresh your memory with its very own synopsis. Surviving a shipwreck en route to London from Jamaica was just the start of Jamina St. Mar's nightmare. Suffering from amnesia, she was separated from anyone who might know her and imprisoned in Bedlam. She was freed only because barrister Daniel Thackeray, Lord Ashbrook, was convinced to betray the one thing he holds dear, the law. Desperate to unearth her true identity, Jamina's only chance is to purloin dangerous secrets with the help from the widow's grace, which means staying steps ahead of the formidable Daniel, no matter how strongly she is drawn to him. Married only by proxy, now witted by shipwreck, Daniel's determined to protect his little stepdaughter Hope from his family's scandalous reputation. That's why he has dedicated himself not just to the law, but to remaining as proper, upstanding, and boring as can be. But the closer he becomes to the mysterious, alluring Jemina, the more Daniel is tempted to break the very rule of law to which he's devoted his life. And as ruthless adversaries close in, will the truth require him and Jemina to sacrifice their one chance at happiness? Ah! I'm so I'm really excited for this one. This I one has too. like the tropes that I love. Mm-hmm. And we have an episode on the first book in the series. So if you want to brush up on that before you grab this one, you should definitely check that out. That's a Duke, a la- the lady and a baby. So you should check that one out. And then we also were so lucky to have Vanessa Riley, not Vanessa Zoltan, <laughs> but <laughs> Vanessa Riley join us for a Bridgerton episode, the fourth episode. So if you haven't listened to that already, you definitely should. She's fabulous. And I just like, I'm really excited to read this book. I am really. I was really intrigued by Jamina in the first book, so I definitely want to learn more about her now. Um, If you'd like to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets, Facebook slash T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets, and YouTube by searching our name. And if you are listening to us on YouTube, now is a great time to click that thumbs up and hit subscribe before you forget. Liking and commenting on our videos and subscribing to our channel is a really wonderful way to let us know that you like what we're doing. All right. And for June, we are going to be doing Ask a Strumpet. So we are looking for questions that we can record in June, and they can be questions about pretty much anything. Books, romance, personal things that we may or may not answer depending (laughs) on what they are just ask away and we'll be compiling them all into an episode for june so you can send us your questions bit.ly slash ask a strumpet and if you'd like to know ahead of time what we're reading each month subscribe to our email notifications via our website if you subscribe you're the first to know what we're reading each month plus you'll get all sorts of extras including exclusive content from each of the authors or guests who join us on the podcast Our website is romancepod.com, and there you can find episodes, more info about us, and other resources. So take a look. Finally, rate, review, and tell a friend. Reviews on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or anywhere else you can review us really help other listeners find the podcast. And word of mouth is also one of the best ways that podcasts get found. So if you like what you're hearing, we'd love for you to spread the word.
Today, we are honored to be joined for our discussion by Vanessa Zoltan. So Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me to do one of my favorite things, which is talk about romance novels. Yay. And I am... I'm a big fan. Um, I've been listening to many of your podcasts for years. Um, in fact, I found Harry Potter and the Sacred Text at a time in my life when it was just perfect. And I think you guys were talking about book two when I found it. So wow, it was a- you're an early adopter. Yeah, and I would I was healing after a um, a big surgery and. It um, was the thing that I would like treat myself with when I would take a walk in the mornings down the beach and I was living abroad. And so it was very fancy. And (laughs) seriously, it was like, was it 1817 when you were doing this? Yes, I uh, yeah, I was I was perambulating down the boardwalk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so I just um, I'm so excited, and then I saw that there's this podcast called Hot and Bothered coming out, and it was also had Julia Quinn, and I I was like, oh, of course I'll listen to that, and I downloaded it, and I was like wait a minute, I know this voice. (laughs) (laughs) So I just somehow hadn't made the connection, you know, and all that. And you guys are starting up again with Harry Potter, reading it from the beginning. I just listened to an episode and I'm just like, it's such an exciting time in that podcast too. We decided to not coordinate at all. And so we are restarting two of our podcasts and launched a third podcast all in two months. Oh my goodness. So we have season three of Hot and Bothered coming out, which is going to be all about Jane Eyre. Ooh. And then we are redoing Harry Potter and the Sacred Text with a new host and a, a slightly amended format, which just started. And then we launched a new podcast called The Real Question. And someone would be in charge of planning that in theory. That was <laughs> me. And so it's all my fault. And everyone at my company loves me right now. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, Yeah, that sounds like a very busy time, but a lot of really exciting projects and really, really fun things. Yeah, it's all fun. It's just not nice of me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, manager. Uh, you're like, if I can't sleep, no one gets to sleep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and I mean, Zoe, you know, this is the editor. Like, there are certain things that Kelsey, you and I, as the talent, right? Like, we just like can't help anymore, right? Like, mm-hmm. we, I have to do a little bit more prep, but not a ton more prep. But it, it's really the production behind the scenes people who aren't sleeping. And so I just lie about how much I sleep. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm exhausted too. Um, but they're the ones who have to work so hard. So I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, uh, as a listener of those uh, projects, I'm thankful. So I mean, and you know, we do these things for the listeners and also for ourselves, because yeah. like, there's a lot of, um, There's just a lot of reward, you know, in doing something creative that, uh, you know, is part of your passion. So all those good things. Yeah. So we're going to start off our Q&A session, which um, our favorite question and the most difficult one. Do you have a favorite romance novel? So I have such a cheat of an answer. Like, yes. And it's Jane Eyre by (laughs) Charlotte Bronte. Ah. For those of you who have never heard of it. Um, (laughs) I, I like wrote a book about it. I can do a little self-promotion and say my book is called Praying with Jane Eyre and it comes out in July. Um, I love romance novels so much that I believe that they should be treated as sacred texts and like we should live our lives in conversation with romance novels. They are like about radically imagining a better way that the world could be like we do not have to live in patriarchy the way that we do Mm -hmm. and romance novels like explore this alternate possible reality and it like ends with hope and happiness so Jane Eyre is I would say like one of the two foundational texts that like programmed all of us Mm -hmm. and how we think about all of us in the west who think about how to love and how to feel loved so I would argue that it's foundational regardless of whether or not you like it but that is my favorite, but I will say Julia Quinn's Bridgerton romance novels are the, are the novels that like got me into voraciously reading 50 romance novels a year. That was my starter set. Yeah. My gateway gateway romance was the Bridgerton series. 
which I realize is cliche now, but I'm a total hipster about it. I loved it first. (laughs) I was just talking to someone and they were like, oh, I'm not a big reader. I've never read romance. And I was like, oh, well, did you watch the Bridgerton show? She's like, oh my God, I loved it. I just devoured it. And I'm like, so yeah, (laughs) it's based off a series and... BT Dubs, I have a podcast. Yeah. And if you <laughs> aren't super into reading it, we have a synopsis of what the second season is going to be about. And you can listen to it and then maybe pick up the book because it's so good. So good. And I just was like, you know, that's based off a romance series, right? Yeah. Like, just well, FYI. <laughs> I'm so excited because I read, I read, like I said, I really read a romance novel a week almost. Like it's, it's, It's a great hobby. Like it is a very healthy obsession. But so many of them are so cinematic and would be such good movies and Mm -hmm. such good TV shows. And I'm like, Hollywood, hello. Follow in the footsteps of Shonda Rhimes. Like option all of these. I just reread Alyssa Cole's A Duke by Default. And I was like, we've got like a Scotland hot swordsman and like this beautiful, like black New Yorker coming together and wealth and power. I was like, why isn't this a thing? Anyway. Well, it's so true. They really are cinematic. And I always think about it too, because how many movies are being redone right now? Like Hollywood seems to have run out of ideas. And I'm like, there is a whole genre of books that could totally, like, let me tell you, if they may, they could make a TV sh- series out of um, Cressley Cole's Immortals After Dark series, which is like hot and spicy. And it's got lore. It's got fa- werewolves. It's got vampires. It's got sexy things. Like it's got badass women. And I'm like, hell yeah, that could easily be a series. I mean, the Lifetime original movie, like, is its own mm-hmm. thing, right? And so the, and the Hallmark Channel did it, and they know that it sells. Right. It's, like, it's very formulaic. And romance novels are also very formulaic, but, like, a lot of the plots are, are outlandish as well, but a lot more developed and have a lot more of those empowering mm-hmm. themes rather than just, the, you know, the man who's coming in t- at, to the woman's small town to, like you know, see, see her sad Christmas tree business, like out of bit. So I just feel like they know it would sell. Why not just do the better thing? <laughs> I mean, like, because they are sexist and no one wants to be known for making yes. them. And like, really, right? Like in 2009, Mama Mia was more successful than James Bond. And it was, a, it was, I think 2007 or 2008, that Sex in the City was the biggest movie of the summer. And everyone was like, well, Sex in the City is like its own thing. It's an outlier. And then Mamma Mia was the biggest movie. And like again and again, women have proven that we are willing to pay money for art that is tailored to us, like an art where we see our stories and our aspirations reflected. And they just don't, they, they are leaving piles of gold on the table in order to not be seen as making like fluff. It's just like designers don't want to make size 14 clothes, right? Like you're leaving money on the table, right? (laughs) You're leaving money on the table to not look a certain way. It's so weird. It's funny you bring up Mamma Mia because Mamma Mia is one of my like, I just need to watch a movie and feel good about life. And Mamma Mia, I've seen that movie so many times. Because it's one I'll, of them. I'll f- compete with you. About it. <laughs> well, it's one of my go. Like I've got a few yeah. go tos that are like I need to feel good right now. And the thing is, if I want to feel good, I want upbeat music. Yeah. I want a happy story. I don't want blood guts or drama. I want I just, great costumes. I want great costumes. Um, I would love a musical number if at all possible. <laughs> and I want the ending to be like, <sighs> yeah. And like a Grecian view doesn't hurt. Oh yeah, no, definitely not. Like, yeah. well, it seems like I've got some watching and some reading to do because I have <laughs> never seen Mamma Mia, nor have <gasps> I. I think I've seen it on stage somewhere, but I haven't seen the, the movie. But um, I also have never read Jane Eyre. Well, that's sort of not true. I tried to read it because my best friend read it when she was nine. And so because she did it, I had to do it. You know, it was one of those things. She was just very smart and wonderful. And I don't know if she, what she got out of it. And uh, not that's not the right time to read it. No. So it sounds like now would be a great time. And then I can listen along. <laughs> yeah. 
So before we get into the book we're talking about today, I had just two more questions, though. So you actually got to work a little bit with Julia Quinn for Hot and Bothered. And what was that like? How did that come to be? Um, mm, It's a mortifying story. Like, really, <laughs> like, it's a really embarrassing story. I... I was working and living at Harvard at the time, and I Googled, we were working on the podcast, um, Hot and Bothered Season 1. So uh, so we were sitting around, um, Bridget Gogg and Ariana Nettleman and I, two of the producers and I, and we were like, oh, wouldn't it be so fun to get Julia Quinn? And so I Googled her, and I saw that she had lived in the freshman dorm that I was currently living in. And so there's just, like, nothing like, like dorm nostalgia in general, And then Harvard folk just love other Harvard folk. Like, it's just, I'd like to think it's true at all universities. I think it is. But it's, like, disgustingly sycophantic. And so I wrote (laughs) her her PR rep. And she wrote back, like, I mean, within minutes, being like, I think this is something Julia would be interested in doing. And then, um, and that got us in the door. And then she lives in Seattle. And we were going to Seattle for work, like, the following month. And so... Ariana and I asked, like, can we take you to dinner? And we took her to dinner and it was like, she and I both have family in the San Fernando Valley. Like it was just this like instant click of easy chatting. And she is legitimately like the loveliest, most generous person. And I think that I'm now allowed to tell the story. So we went to dinner and she was like, can, can you guys keep a secret? And we were like, yes. And this was three years ago. Oh my gosh. She was like, I signed with Shondaland today to have Bridgerton made on Netflix. And we were like, no way. <laughs> um, and so that was, you know, whenever we would record with her, oh we would record gosh. virtually, but she would like screen share and show us a picture of the script or the moment where she told us that Julie Andrews was playing Lady Whistledown. I was just like, I want to oh. faint, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, so we just like met her at this moment that wow. it feels so special to have met her right then. But she's just right, like she's just like a master of her craft, and is just like funny and weird and delightful, and like walked us back to her hotel because she had to get her steps in, and you know, like <laughs> all the things. Like she's fantastic. Oh my gosh, that is that is. So exciting and fun. And I I really do find that generally with romance authors, how yeah. kind they are. And maybe it's also like a female to female empowerment thing. And I know that that's not, it's not across the board. And I know that there's, you know, pettiness anywhere you go or, you know, jealousy or those sort of things. But for my, yeah, yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but from my experience, I've just been so overwhelmed by the kindness yeah. that, romance authors seem to exhibit and it, it's just it's been so wonderful you know and generosity yeah and we've really experienced that like we've you know reached out to a bunch of different authors and at some point like pretty much like I will say almost everyone we've reached out to if they've responded to us it's been a yes I would love to do that yeah. And we understand people are busy and it's just like, it's so nice that they can take the time out to come talk to us. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a podcast, right? There's a million out there and it's just a free of your time. Yeah. Um, but we've had some amazing conversations, you know, and it's just, it's, it's great. Julie, we sent her flowers when we wrapped with her because all of her work with us was unpaid. And she called and was like why did you send me flowers I should have sent you flowers and we were like literally no (laughs) no like she's like that is how generous she is Mm -hmm. oh wow so I feel like this next question could be an entire discussion but (laughs) I'm going to ask it anyway I'll try to keep it short no you take your time because I'm so interested in this and I I also feel like all of the podcasts you do kind of explain Explore this theme in long format. But I'm curious if you have any specific advice or thoughts for people who start to look at texts they love critically. How do you balance the enjoyment of your text under that magnifying glass? I think it just totally depends on the relationship that you want to have with the text. There are books that I read completely uncritically and like just in the privacy of my own, often I, I listen to a lot of romance novels while I'm cooking dinner, commuting, walking the dog. 
And like they go in my little book of books and really I, they accompany me and I don't think about them again. And then I, if a friend asks for a rec and I give it, they'll be like, oh, you don't have a problem with X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, that <laughs> is not how I was reading that book. Mm-hmm. Nope, didn't bother me at all. But what I would say is that you should listen to your inner antenna because sometimes I will be reading a book with the exact same like orientation and something about it will bug me. And I'll just be like, mm, I don't know what this is. And that I think is when we should start to look more critically and wonder at what is actually going on here. Is it because the text is being sexist, is being too overly generous to someone with a lot of power, is something like racist and icky going on, right? Like, and so then I would say, right, like you should really read up on what it is that gives you that ickiness factor and try to understand it. Because I think that our instincts will tell us, right? Like our, our pain helps us advocate in the world for people who have had similar pain. And I think our antenna do that too. And it, it can't be our job to advocate for everything, right? When I, I'm very interested in disability theory, but when, until somebody taught me about disability theory, I did not read romance and think there really isn't any representation of disabled bodies, right? Like that wasn't something that I was aware of until somebody else's antenna, like got them to express that and taught me. So I I would say it's like, listen to your instinct, but then really give yourself permission to follow that instinct and turn it into some research. I think that reading critically, thinking critically, it is hard. It's a lot of work. And so you should do it with things that naturally interest you um, rather than try to follow every single possible rabbit hole. The other thing is that people can criticize books that I love and I, part of loving something is knowing that it's not perfect, right? Like I love my partner so much and he is not perfect. Like, (laughs) so, and I can tell you everything that's wrong with him in my opinion. And he can tell you everything I think is wrong with him. Right. So you can still love imperfect things. I don't think we should shame ourselves when we, it turns out that we do love something that's problematic or worthy of criticism. And I think that's especially true in romance because like I have such a big problem out in the world with bosses coming on to their employees. Like it is Mm -hmm. so inappropriate, right? Like if we look at Andrew Cuomo, right? Like those women were trapped, like they would rebuff him and feel uncomfortable around him. So they would get transferred. It's horrible. It super excites me when I read about it. Like the governess <laughs> game, yes. The Julian yeah. Long book with the housekeeper and the French prince, yes. Like, and so just because I, I love to read it doesn't mean that I think it should exist out in the world. I can't agree more. And I really liked your advice of looking to things that you love to look at critically, because I think that sometimes like people get intimidated by you know, feeling like they should be X, Y, Z. But if you actually just say, no, this is what I love. And and, and how can I look at this maybe a little differently if I want to, to get a little bit more out of it and grow myself. And that's kind of why we love talking about romance novels too. I think both of us came into this podcast like, oh, fun romance novel podcast, and we'll break them down and we'll talk about things. And just naturally, when you start breaking something down, you think about it differently and you look at it differently. And I think Kelsey and I have both come a long way in how we look at at things and what we enjoy about that. And also we have a long way to go too, you know, with articulating, articulating it is, is the most difficult point. But like you said, that's where the research comes in. Yeah. I, the other thing I'll say is that it's a combination of listening to your instincts, but also pushing yourself, right? Like there will be months where I'll be like, I am not going to read anything by a white lady this month. And like, what a gift to like put that parameter and just like force myself to read books by people who I wouldn't necessarily look to read. It's like, it's how I found Alicia Rye, right? It's how I found mm-hmm. Talia Hibbert. Like you find these amazing authors who speak to you. And as someone with a chronic disease, reading Talia Hibbert, uh, I was like, thank you for writing about me, right? Like it was a totally new way to feel seen. So I think it's important to, yes, like listen to our antenna, but also to push ourselves. 
Absolutely. I mean, and I will say same thing on our little journey here. We've, we've, again, our podcast is pretty narrow. It's Regency Romance, right? right. Georgian Regency Victorian. So like, it's pretty narrow, but I didn't realize how narrow it was until I started a podcast about it. Right. right. So then we both make an effort to like go out there and find a little bit more diversity in the genre to try to read it and promote it and, you know, get people excited about it because there's so much more than just Dukes. Love my Dukes, but <laughs> yeah, like Beverly Jenkins and Alyssa Cole are out there writing amazing like African-American stories in the same time period. Yeah. And Vanessa Riley's new book too. Um, and so there's just, well, books, I should say. And there's there's some smaller indie ones that we've found or even, you know, the same sex couples. I had never read any of those books before I started this podcast. And yeah. thank goodness that I now have. Yeah, that was another one. Like I never would have thought to read like a same sex couple. And yet- they've become some of my favorites and like, they're so good and they're just as steamy for me. Even if I can't relate to it on a personal level, it's still, you know, there's still the thing about it is, is that it's called empathy because we can identify with other people's emotions and put them on ourselves. Well, on that note, I think that we should talk about the book that we came here to talk about today and all of the emotions that it made us feel. So yes. (laughs) There was a lot of emotions. <laughs> he is the biggest jerk that I've read in a while. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's get into those general thoughts. So Vanessa, what did you think about A Rogue by Any Other Name? Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, I love Sarah McLean. I love Sarah McLean. Um. And I love, like, anything set at the gaming house, the Fallen Angel. Mm -hmm. Like, I love this world. This one was tough for me. Um, There were some things that I really liked about it. The, like, Penelope, the main character, is, like, just wonderful. And I would spend all the time in the world with her. I love how protective she is of her sisters. I think the book does a pretty good job, but not quite a good enough job for me, of, like, making him a redeemable jerk. He's just like a little too close to irredeemable for my taste. I I agree. I also had a little bit of a hard time with this one where again, like I love Sarah McLean and her writing is beautiful. It's like, it's, it's not hard to keep reading because it's so, ah. you know, it's so well-written, but I also had a hard time kind of connecting with these characters. Again, I, I agree. Like I thought Penelope was a much stronger, more interesting character than Bourne. And I also was thinking a lot about this because I, I haven't read a lot of Sarah McLean in a while. And then this book got me started, right? Like I was just like, okay, well now I, I remember the second and third books. Like I remember really loving them. So I just like dove in and read those ones too. And it was interesting because I think for me, this book is just maybe not the tropes that I like the most. And one thing I think Sarah McLean is really good with and loves to do is the groveling, like the mm-hmm. the hero who has done such wrong and he has to grovel and come back. And I think for me, that's just like not my favorite. A lot mm-hmm. of people really love that. Totally. Kelsey, what about you? I'm going to be the complete opposite because I thoroughly enjoyed this book. <laughs> that's like, great. I, I don't know. There's something about that jerky hero who like And so for me, like, will I say Penelope was the stronger of the two characters? Yes. Did I love her immediately? Yes. We can talk more about that later. (laughs) But for me, like, I like the jerk hero who can't seem to stop himself. And he's like, oh, feelings. Like, what are those? And he's like so set on revenge. And then for me, I think my favorite part of it is he gets to the point where he has his like revenge in hand. And he's just like, oh, fuck, what have I done? Like, because he literally has that moment and he's like on the precipice of enacting all of it. And then he's like, oh, fuck, this is what she was trying to tell me. This is what she's been saying all along. I'm such an idiot. And so I thoroughly enjoyed it. I liked the whole thing about it because like I felt like he, he was a jerk. But again, he was so fixated on his stupid revenge plot that there wasn't really enough room. And even though everyone was trying to tell him that he was being dumb, he couldn't see it until he actually was faced with it. And so I personally really liked it. I also really liked that every side character was like 
uh, especially the men were like, well, if you don't want her, I'll have her. Like, <laughs> I'll take her if you don't want her because she's fabulous. And they're like, well, she's great. What's wrong with you? And um, yeah, I did the same thing, Zoe, Zoe. I read this one. I had read it before. Turns out I had not read three and four. Like, for some reason, I like didn't get around to it. Or I think what it was is three just didn't interest me quite as much because I really liked, I really identified with Penelope and Pippa. And so then I was like, I wrote off number three because it wasn't the characters I want. Like, I didn't understand. The, I didn't like the characters. There. I was like, I wanted it to be a different character. Anyway, I did read it. It was fabulous. Number four. I thought number four is a little weaker, but then like, I think it's just like filling up the time thing. Although I did like number four. I just felt of the three, it was of the four. It was the weakest for me. But that's besides the point. We're not even talking about number four. Anyway, I am the opposite. Agree. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed this jerky hero. But that's just me. I think I like a jerky hero who grovels at the end. <laughs> well, I'm actually a little surprised because this book also had a lot of what you and I often don't enjoy, Kelsey, which is the kind of like the misunderstanding trope yeah. mm -hmm. where like they could just have a conversation yeah. and things could be fixed. Now, Sarah McLean also, I've noticed, does this a lot in her books, mm -hmm. but often just makes it so they, like, you really understand why they can't have that conversation. Mm -hmm, like, there's right. something like orphans or something, you know, like, there's some, there's some you know, poor, poor soul who, if they told, they would be looped in it, and that's why this person can't possibly let know their secret. But I didn't feel that so much in this one. What conversation do you wish Penelope and Michael would have had? Um, so I think like somewhere in the the first third of the book, he was doing his like, I can't love her. Like I can't, I can't have, you know, do that. And he just kind of like left her at the townhouse the first night after being yeah. married and just like ran. And I think if he had just said like, anything at that point to, yeah. it, it might have set something up but also like if they pretty soon after that there was like another opportunity that they could have had a conversation to you know I, I, he just kept holding her at arm's length and I yeah. felt like mm -hmm. rather you know rather than saying actually like I don't want to have a close relationship with you which again, wouldn't work for our romance novel if, if that, if he didn't want to, but I just felt like, I don't know. I, that, that kind of tension between the two of them isn't my favorite thing to read. Totally. And it, it did feel like the conversations would always get cut off right before the essential part happened. So I'm going to, I'm going to say I loved groveling sequence number one and did not love groveling sequence number two. Groveling sequence number one, what I would say it is, is the ice skating scene oh, when he is beautiful. like, I will make, I will like make a deal with you, right? Yes. Like I will exchange something with you. I will give you something you want if you let me spend the day with your family. And he is I, so kind to her sisters. And as someone who like loves acts of service <laughs> and like, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just like, yes. That is loving. Thank you for showing that. I was ready. I was ready to marry him at that point. <laughs> I was super into that traveling. When he's like sitting there with charades in the family, he's like, yeah, I'll participate in charades with the family. I'm just like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> and the, the like pathetic, beautiful moment where he's like, I want to be the one who guesses what it is she's acting out. I don't want her yeah. sisters to get it. I want to yeah. be the one to prove that we have a connection. I was like, okay. it's pathetic. I love it. But like second groveling, I'm like, eh, too late. You've called her so many mean things. And like, she was actually the one who sort of convinced you, like gambled so that the big like blackmail thing couldn't happen. Yeah, she was the one who freaking saved yeah. your ass. And I was unmoved by Gravel number two. Yeah, I think it felt a little anticlimactic, like yeah. because the first one, especially, had been so poignant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think too, is it more like Gravel number two was like, he kind of let her do it because he's like, oh, then I don't have to gamble anymore. And I can keep the promise of never gambling again. And this time I didn't gamble away the future, blah, 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 blah. But I just think for me, the second grovel, I wasn't even looking at it for the grovel. I just was more, I really enjoyed. At the end, she's like, I did what all good gamblers do. I bluffed. He's just like, 
oh my God, this woman I married is so amazing. And I was like, yeah, she is amazing. And you didn't realize it until just now. Like, really? Everyone's been telling you she's amazing. Except, but he did realize it earlier. And then yeah. he like reneged on that. So I, I'm with, I don't know, Vanessa and I are See, ganging up on you. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's okay because I totally understand that because you get to that point where you have the first Bravo session and you feel like you're going to build something and then they're going to conquer the evil together. But instead yeah. they start to go towards that point and then he does a complete 180 and he's like, get back ye woman, cannot love you. Right. And then he's all dumb about it. So we talked about one other, actually we talked about two other Sarah McLean's on the podcast. I think we've talked about um, the nine something, something, something. Nine something rules, rules to break, break. romancing a rake. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> that one. I read that uh, one. Yeah. And I really like it, but I think we both, and that was her first book. And so we were talking about how on that one, it also felt a little long in the fact that like, similarly, like there was like a second grovel and, or a third grovel. And it felt like maybe, you know, one of those grovels was unnecessary because it kind of gave put you on that yo-yo of like going mm-hmm. back and forth with them. But Brazen and the Beast is very much not like that. Oh, it's no. not a groveling romance. And I was thinking about that because I feel like Daring and the Duke, if you've read it, is very groveling. And oh yeah. I I was has to be groveling. <laughs> I was, but I was not. I was not a fan of that one, but I That's loved fair. Brazen and the Beast. So I I was just thinking, as I started thinking more about this, I was like, I think, you, you know, certain tropes that she does, I really resonate with. And then others, I just, they, they just don't draw me in like they drew you in. So the thing I'll defend both nine rules um, to break, and this one, a rogue by any other name, is that the women are really interested in adventure. And I find that to be really compelling in both of those books, right? That they are like, they are women who are demanding to live outside of the strictures of society Mm -hmm. and are like using the men in their lives in order to get that done. And I find that very compelling, Mm -hmm. right? Like it's the Hillary Clintons of their day, right? It's like, I am going to use you as much as you are using me because I am an ambitious woman in my own right. And I I really like that about Penelope. And I think that something interesting to be said about that with both of those in the sense that like, it's the men, like these women are like, I want the adventure. I'm going to use you to get the adventure. And then the men are like, whoa, whoa, but you don't mean that. And they're like, why don't you think I know what I mean? Like, I do mean that. And it takes a while for them to be fully supportive. So it's a very interesting dynamic of the women wanting to break society norms. So they find a man who's already broken the society norms. And yet the man's like, but whoa, 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 I need you in your societal place because like, you'll resent me if I don't give that to you. And they're like, no, this is what I want. It's very like, believe my words, right? Yeah. It's very like pro listen to women. They will tell Mm -hmm. you what they want. Can I tell you one other thing I liked about the broke by any other name. Mm-hmm. I'm horrible with romance titles. You're in good company. <laughs> yeah, to me too. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. Just give me more. So one of the problems with the book, I would say, is that you're not quite sure why Penelope loves Michael so much. Mm. She is like very interested in trying this. Part of me understands she has all of these, like she really wants to get married in order to rescue the reputations for her sisters so her sisters can get married. And so she's like, fine, I'll marry people. Who, I, I want to marry for love, but I will make a sacrifice for my sisters. And then this guy comes in and it's, I feel like it's similar to the reason why people voted for Donald Trump. It was like, it's just crazy and let's see what happens, right? Like, I feel like people just like wanted to watch something new happen. And that's almost like why she chooses Michael as much as she's given the opportunity to choose him. But Which So, like, that doesn't totally feel compelling enough to me. I'm like, that seems like just, like, Trump voters. I'm like, just being bored is, like, not (laughs) a reason to potentially blow up your life in the world. But what makes it so great are all these letters that we, at the beginning of every chapter, right? Like, the letters that, so she and Michael were childhood friends. And so every chapter begins with a letter either from Penelope to Michael or Michael to Penelope. And then toward the middle of the book, they become letters that Penelope wrote that were were unanswered because he stopped um, writing back. And then towards the end of the novel, they're letters that she never even sent. But we get the sense that, like, he's been the person in her mind who she's constantly been in conversation with. And I found that to be 
compelling as like a childhood sweetheart story. I was like, I know how Zoe feels about things in front of the <laughs> chapters. Um, <laughs> you don't like them? I I often find that the things that are put in front of chapters just detract from the story or they're there like because the author has done that in their series and so they continue doing it. Like and some of like when when Julia Quinn continues to do it in Bridgerton after Lady Whistledown, mm -hmm. there are some of those books that I feel the the part before the chapter is more successful than others. Sure. Um, but for this one, I I did find it a little melodramatic, but I actually agree with you in that if we didn't have, like, I don't know what other way we would know that. Like, I don't right. know how else we would be we would get that information. And I think without that information, their love story is not as sweet or strong. So I, I, I was torn. I didn't particularly enjoy them. I, I find the same in fantasy. Like when, when my fantasy book has like a paragraph before every, I have one of my favorite series does this. And I'm just like, <laughs> Brandon Sanders said, I don't need this information. It never turns into <laughs> anything, but it's, uh, I read it anyway. So <laughs> The Bridgerton books have Lady Whistledown after she's been exposed in Colin's no, book? No, there's no, it's oh. not Lady Whistledown. Okay. It turns into, in Eloise's book, it's like random it's letters. letters she wrote random to letters. people. Wrote. And then in Francesca's, it's... Um, letters between her and Michael? I think it's letters between her and Michael. Or and like the non-letters, or this letters that he sent her, something like that. Got it. Hyacinth's book is the journal that she finds, and I yeah. don't remember mm -hmm. what what Gregory's book is, but you know, it, yeah. yeah. So it's it's just different. Got it. I agree with you a bit more. Like I found it very interesting about the letters more because I think I think what those letters did in this book was it showed why she was so willing to like trust this man who was like, I'm going to force you into marriage because you're part of my plan. But, you know, she was like, well, I did just get an ultimatum about marrying this year. And at least he and I have a history and there seems to be some kind of spark still there, you know? And then I think that you kind of see why she held on to that because he did and she even acknowledged that where she kind of made him into more than what he was, because at some point she was still writing letters to him that weren't she didn't even send. And but it was because he kind of in an essence became her, I don't want to say higher power, but in a sense, a higher power, you know, like because you're if you're like journaling to someone and you like that was those letters she didn't send were the ones where she was most needing advice and didn't know who to turn to. So she kind of turned to this person who she was safe talking to because she didn't actually send the letters and she didn't hope for a reply. But he still was kind of in a sense that like higher power, imaginary friend sort of person that she could lay a burden down. And then that's where you get the conflict in the novel in the sense that like she still has this person who she has built up in her head and he's constantly pushing her away. And she's like, but you're the person I was supposed to turn to and you're pushing me away. And so it's getting past the idea of the Michael who was versus the Michael who is. Right. I also realized that this is, I believe, a Hades and Persephone retelling. And a lot of people really love Hades, Persephone stories. That just blew my mind. And I'm now trying tracking it in my head. So so I, I read it in a bunch of Goodreads reviews that people were saying that I'm not a huge Hades Persephone person. So I think also if you really love that that yeah. trope, then then you can see that one. And the next one is, in the series is Orpheus and Eurydice. And then the third one is just Beauty of the Beast. So, but um, <laughs> Orpheus and Eurydice, which one? It, it doesn't matter. I will look this up because yeah. that necessarily has a a sad ending. Yes, it is. It is not completely that, but it is right. very similar. He sees himself right. at, and they even talk about Orpheus and Eurydice in, the, do, book. in the book. Yeah. They mention it. Oh my so, God. I have to read it. <laughs> so yeah. So I, and I think like that, that that's really cool. I just wanted to mention that too, but before we moved on, but let's just narrow in a little bit on our hero here. I think we've talked a lot about him and we always give our hero and heroine a rating out of 10. Um, so I'm, I'm ready to go in and rate, rate our hero here. And so just the scale is completely subjective. Generally, we say five is take it or leave it, right? So we could take it or leave it. And I'm going to give Born a six. I just didn't connect that hard with him. Wait, I, 10 being like, I'd marry you tomorrow? Yes. 10 being yeah. like the best hero ever. 
Okay, yeah. and then one is what? One we've never, is, we've really true. gotten below. Like four was the lowest that we've done so far. Yeah. But five is like take it or leave it. And then four, like anything below that, I think is is something that you I don't know. viscerally hate the hero. I feel like if it's below a four, you need to viscerally hate them. I mean, you <laughs> name this term because, like, one is like I wouldn't wish him upon my enemy. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I think like there, and then there's shades of I find him to be problematic, or mm-hmm. I would, yeah, I, I, I yeah, and, and we always say like I'm gonna give Born an eight because for me, like we always say like an eight's like a solid hero, like. You know, there's some backstory, like he could be better, but like he's solid. So for me, he's an eight. So interesting. Vanessa, where would where would he fall for you? I am only going to do this because I don't want to break podcast precedent. I will give him a four. My instinct was to give him like a two because like I would be upset if one of my friends was dating him. I'd be like, That's what fair. are you doing? He blackmailed you yeah. into dating him. <laughs> he is not nice to you. He's like really talks down to you by always like teaching you what a rogue and a gambler does. Like that's yeah. super mansplainy. Yes. Um, and like <laughs> the only thing as if like I know now you're making me be like, oh maybe he no. wasn't so great. But you know what that's okay because I'm still gonna go with I really enjoyed him while I was reading it. So there we go. <laughs> That's the thing, right? It's like he just didn't do anything for me. I I love so many jerks in romance novels. And for some reason, I like this guy. I, the thing the the one of the things I find least attractive in the world is obvious hypocrisy. And like we are all hypocrites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he is somebody who wants to exact revenge. His his life is motivated <laughs> by wanting revenge on someone who he lost a fair bet to. Yeah. While he runs a gambling hell. Yeah. And I'm just like, I can't <laughs> circle that square. You're an asshole. You're just like a whiny baby. You well, lost a bet. Yeah, he lost a bet when he was 21 and his whole soul thing is no, revenge. No. He's like, I lost a bet to the man that was supposed to help me. And instead he took everything away from me. It's like, yeah, because you were stupid and you were 21. And let's be real. We were all stupid when we were 21. I think he was, a, I think he was younger, but still, I mean, like. No, no he's, he's 21. 21. He's definitely 21. It was 21 was, with 21. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. I was ready to be like, oh, was he 16? And then they say he's 21. Oh. I'm like, you are such a freaking hypocrite. Like, he's constantly ruining people. Anyway. Well, that you know, was why his, like, he's like society. T- well, anyway, that's a whole other discussion for the whole book. That was what the whole thing was founded. Their whole gaming hell was founded upon the fact that they were going to fleece all the people who did them wrong. Anywho. <laughs> those people didn't do them wrong. No, but they say they perpetuated the system. And so, therefore, they need to ru- Oh, I know. It's uh, all a hypocrisy. I hate it. Anyway. I hate it. I, Vanessa, I love it because, you know, sometimes maybe I'm a little too nice. Um, so I appreciate your explanation and it, it makes me want to change my score, but I, no. I said it, so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> I'm going to like, you guys can have me back on and you guys could trash a hero. And if I like, you could make the most compelling arguments in the world. I'll be like, I don't care. He's hot. <laughs> but that's okay. Like, you know, we've had that discussion before where it's always like, this dude's a 10. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, he's good, but he's not a 10 (laughs) and vice versa. So it's totally fine. But our heroine, let's talk about Penelope. She's like a solid eight for me. Mm -hmm. Like she cares so much about her sisters. That gets really far for me. And she wants adventure. Yeah, I I agree. I think Penelope, I would, I would also give her an eight. Um, I don't identify with her as much as many other heroines um, that I that I read, but I think like there's a lot to commend about her uh, and reading her on the page. Um, there's a lot of strong, exciting stuff, you know. Like she, in the in the beginning of the book, she's the one who initiates the um, the the first encounter that they have um, because she's like I, you know. It, want to be ravaged on the night that I'm being ruined, you know? So like, right. excuse me, um, can we do something about this? <laughs> so yeah, 
um, yeah, I, I really, I really liked her. Um, and of course, we get so much payoff with her at the end, making the bet, taking the bet for him, you know, kind of saying like, I'm not going to let him bet again. Also, I am tired of this man's bullshit tired of hit. I'm tired of both of these men's bullshit, to be honest. Yes. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to finish this for once and for all. And then of course she does the most incredible bluff. Like it is. Yeah. And that yeah. is such a payoff. Um, yeah. so I mean, yeah, I, I give her an eight also. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give her a nine. Um, cause I love her. And I think part of it's because I'm someone who, I think I could just identify with her more in the sense that like, and maybe this is why I'm okay with Michael because I'm someone who really holds on to friendships and like have been like deeply hurt. And I still feel the hurt from people who like I was friends with and then like they decided to reject me in some way. And especially because I don't know why it's just like we were friends and then suddenly we weren't. And I am, I'm a Hufflepuff. I'm loyal to a fault. And (laughs) so for me, like to have that rejection, it really stings. So like I could really identify with the fact that like this guy that she, you know, really cared about and loved, like came back. And even though it wasn't perfect, she's like, well, he's still there. And like, I still have this, like, for me, I have this connection there. And so I guess I could just really identify with that an emotional level, just because like I said, I really, even to this day, I'll think about like things that happened 10 years ago, like someone rejected me and like that sting is still so real for me. And it's just like, I don't know why we're not friends. And, but again, it's because I don't know what the problem was. Like, I don't know when that rejection happened. I don't know. Like we went from being like, talk to each other all the time to suddenly my messages weren't being answered to we haven't talked in years, you know? Maybe both of their parents died and they lost their entailed land (laughs) in a bet and they're just... Yeah, maybe that's what happened, you know, and they bet it all and they're just regrouping and living a life of revenge and I just can't touch that. Anyway, I guess I could just emotionally relate to Penelope a little bit more. That's really actually, I mean, I, I'm, I've am i had a couple things like that happen in my life. I think many of us have gone through that, but it, sure. it's really, I think like kind of beautiful to hear you say that and see and hear how you connected with the book on a level that, you know, I I wasn't able to, but I think that was neat to share. So anyway, so that's (laughs) me. So don't just drop me friends. If you don't want me to be your friend anymore, just tell me to my face because then I'll at least know. Do you (sighs) want to at least amend your Michael score now and lower him a little bit? He's one of those friends, Kelsey. I know, (laughs) I know. I'm still gonna He's stick with the it. Problem. I know, but see, this is why. Like, I perpetuate my own problems. <laughs> I think Kelsey <laughs> thinks he's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's really what it is. I just think he's hot. He. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Well, to kind of get us onto a different track, how about we all share a favorite quote? I have one. I just pulled it up. It's great. There were there were so many. There's some things like I was reading this and I was like, I really should be highlighting more. But I just was like really enjoying reading a book and like reading a book because <laughs> I like I've had such trouble reading books lately that I was like, oh, I'm into it. Yay. Just keep reading. <laughs> no, I, I really have to credit this book with the same thing for me. Even though I didn't love this book, it made me want to keep reading. And I haven't had that in a while, especially I, like, like I, I literally have not had that since I had Sarah, which was yeah. October. Mm-hmm. So I've read like a whole bunch of books since then. And it's just been wonderful that this book was like, it led me back into like a mm-hmm. reading binge. So yeah, no, for sure. And it made me want to keep reading more things. Anyway, here's my quote. <clears throat> you selfish man. She took a step toward him. You think I do not understand disappointment? You think I was not disappointed when I watched everyone around me, my friends, my sisters, marry? You think I was not devastated the day I discovered that the man I was to marry was in love with another? You think I was not angry every day that I woke in my father's home knowing that I might never have contentment and that I would never find love? You think it's easy to be a woman like me tossed from one man to another to control father, fiance, now husband. Ooh. And it's just like the best set down ever. <laughs> Ugh, loved it. Sounds a lot like a scene in Jane Eyre, actually. Hmm. Like rhythmically. Anyway, there was a few, but I really just liked that one because it was just the set down of all set downs. <laughs> Mine is similar in tone. 
It's she hated him then, hated the words, the way he spoke them with such simple cruelty. Ooh. I'm like, yes, he, I, I like it. Cause I agree with you, Penelope. He's a jerk. <laughs> well, I've got a couple of maybe lighter ones. Um, <laughs> here we go. He turned to Cross, who had appeared in the doorway next to Bruno. You were to take her home. Cross lifted a shoulder in a lanky shrug. The lady is rather unbiddable. <laughs> Penelope turned a smile on the tall, ginger-haired man. Thank you. That might well be the nicest thing anyone has ever said about me. I love it. I appreciated that with her. Um, Just kind of like in the moment, like I just, I did really like that about her, that she would kind of always have attention for everybody and kind of these just quick sly remarks too. It was just Mm -hmm. very, very fun. So I also like that she's like, last night I said to Peter, I said, I was like, well, and I know I can be a bitch sometimes. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) And, like, I I like it. He, like, knows I can be. And it's, like, and I'm not in – it's a great thing, right? Mm-hmm. So she's, like, yeah, I'm unbiddable. You can't fuck with me. Like, that's yeah. great. I'm, like, I'm glad he knows you can't fuck with me. That's right. <laughs> so, As it should fun. be. Right. Mm-hmm. He would never say it about me, but I feel like I said it. And he was, like, yeah, that is true. Well, speaking of love, um, and I think this is going to be interesting. So we next we have our steaminess rating and our hmm. encounter counter. And I think the three of us read this book fairly differently. So I think this is going to be difficult to settle on a steaminess rating. Hmm, interesting. But we had three encounters. Kelsey, did you find this one steamy? Um, I found it started out very steamy. And then I thought it cooled off a little too quickly because it was like lots of steam right at the beginning. And then there was like zero encounters till like the end. What about you, Vanessa? I I need to... Can I invite myself back on this show? Yes. Because I don't like how negative I'm being. Because I love (laughs) romance novels. (laughs) I did not find this steamy, especially because he does the thing that I hate, which is when he's like, your body wants me. Uh, Yeah, we've had that discussion before. And I'm like, that's not a thing like it just because a woman's wet doesn't or like breathing heavy or whatever like you don't get to say and I find that to be a huge turnoff I'm just like you don't know what my body wants like go away so you unfortunately were expecting hot tea and got a huge ice bath instead exactly exactly (laughs) there's nothing wrong with an ice bath but I it needs to be July (laughs) well And we're running a little long here, so I feel like we could also talk about this for a long time. But our feminist recap, normally we say, is a supporter, neutral, or offender. I feel, I think Vanessa has some opinions on this one. Um, And I think you've, but I think you've said a lot of them. And to be honest, you've you've convinced me. I don't know. What what would you, I'll I'll let you speak instead of speaking for you. (laughs) No, I don't find it. And I think it's neutral because you have a, a woman who like, super isn't afraid to advocate for herself, Mm -hmm. right? Like she will beg, borrow and steal and like befriend the maid and like do whatever she has to do in order to advocate for herself. And that is like a really wonderful model. Um, I just don't like the idea that you like have to, I believe you have to teach people how you like to be treated, but I don't think that you should have to fight to have basic respect. So that is where I would say it falls short, but I would say it's neutral. I, I agree. I think that the Penelope stuff, you know, leans one way and the Bourne stuff leans another. And so I like, I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't not recommend this book ever to someone, you know, depending right. on who the person is in the XYZ. So, so I think, <laughs> I think you're right. Cause I feel like Penelope is like very strong, but again, like it balances out the other thing. So I would say neutral yeah. because we're hitting yeah. in the middle there. Yeah. So then we're at our last thing, which is our final book rating, which again is basically the same scale, subjective. And I'm going to go ahead and jump off the ledge first. I'm going to give this book a five. I could take it or leave it. I just, I didn't, I don't ever need to read it again, but I loved, you know, books two and three in the series. Um, So, and I appreciate that it got me back onto my reading binge. Twist. I'm going to give it a six. (laughs) 
Because, oh. like, I didn't like it. It was just, like, so readable. Yeah. Like, when yeah. I wasn't reading it, I wanted to go back to it. Mm-hmm. So, like, mm-hmm. even though I was – once I was there, I was like, Ugh, you're annoying. But it was, like, fun to be annoyed by him. Yes. So I have taken everything into consideration. I will give this a seven. <laughs> because I understand there's some problems in it. But again, I found it, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I love Penelope. And I think if you like reading characters like Penelope, I think maybe that's what it is. Penelope was so strong that like I could forgive Bourne way more because I just loved Penelope so much. And if she was willing to forgive him, I could get on board with that too. Yeah. And the charades and dog and ice skating scene went a long way for me. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So, Vanessa, this has been such a joy, and I'm so excited to have you back on the podcast. Yeah, great. Please. Oh, oh, you've been back. That's so out of the blue. I'll consider it. Yeah. So we'll look forward to that. But in the meantime, what are you working on, and where can people find you? So I... (laughs) Um, so I have a podcast called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text if you are a Harry Potter fan and then I have a podcast called Hot and Bothered if you're a romance novel fan and we are going to be starting a new season of that on July 2nd where we are going to be doing a close reading of Jane Eyre and then you can pre-order and depending on when you're listening to this buy my book which is called Praying with Jane Eyre yay and Please, God, let that go okay. <laughs> My first book, so. Thank you both so much. This was, like, so fun. I can't believe I get to count this as part of my job right now. So thank you. Well, we're sorry that we kept you over into your next meeting, but we'll let you go. And thank you so much for joining us. And we can't wait for next time. Thank you. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. All right. Bye. bye. Well, Kelsey, I just have to say that we had such a fabulous time, didn't we? Uh, Well, Vanessa's super nice, and we could have easily talked all day. We could have. It's lucky she had a meeting to get to (laughs) in a way, because otherwise I think we would have just kept going and and discussed the whole series. I know, right? And I will say, too, it was such a great – I loved having like a I love whenever we have a guest because like they always have like fresh takes on like what you read and like you and I, our opinions are fairly aligned most of the time. Yes. And so it was really nice to have someone come in and like upend the whole thing and we'd be like, I get what you're saying, but also so supportive and been like, you do you like, I may not like it, but you might. It's why there's so much diversity in this genre. (laughs) Absolutely. And I mean, Vanessa, for those listeners who haven't listened, I mean, her podcasts are really fabulous and really thoughtful. And I think that's kind of like what she was saying, too, which is either when you read different perspectives or you get different perspectives in the room, it does shake things up and it makes you think about things differently and it challenges you a little bit. So I would love to have more and more and more guests on this show to every time we read a book. I wish we could have a, a different guest. Um, logistically, that's quite difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, logistically, you know, Zoe and I can barely schedule ourselves into a room together, a, a virtual room together, I should say. <laughs> and to be honest, editing with another track always takes more time too. So like having a guest is super rewarding, but it's also like extra commitment. So, you know, we have to balance that. But I'm just so glad we had her and I'm fangirling so hard because I am such a big fan. It's so weird and also rare that, you know, when you listen to a podcast for a long time, you kind of think that that person's your friend, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know them well. Um, And it's really weird to actually get to talk to one of those people. I listened to Harry Potter and the Sacred Text for years. I love it. Um, I fell off the bandwagon at some point, um, just probably because of life. But for those of you that don't know about that, that podcast. It's a chapter by chapter reading of Harry Potter, uh, the entire series with a theme each chapter and using that reading as a sacred practice. And I, I'm not explaining it well at all, but I really recommend people check it out. It's really thoughtful and interesting. And the very exciting thing is, you know, 
there are some things that have happened over the years with J.K. Rowling that maybe has made some of us big fans of Harry Potter hesitant about certain things. And so, you know, perhaps going back and listening to to a someone talk about Harry Potter six years ago might not be your jam. But the cool thing is that Vanessa is, like she said, starting it again right now. And something that I love so much, which is Harry Potter, looking at it critically, like chapter by chapter, I started listening again, and it brought me so much joy and reflection and and excitement. And it's a perfect time to get started with Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. And or Hot and Bothered and her Jane Eyre book and all the other things. And again, I said I was fangirling really hard. I continue to fangirl. No, and I think that's totally fair. So, you know, listeners, spoiler alert. um, I did not listen to Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. And Zoe was like, hey, you should listen to Vanessa's podcast before we have her on, which I was like, yeah, fair. That's probably a good plan. Um, (laughs) You know me in prep work, Zoe. Really great at it. Uh, (laughs) You don't mind. You you so far don't mind the the few text messages I will send. So... (laughs) Um, anyway, so I did listen to it and it's so good. Like hot and bothered is where I started and I started at episode one and I am so hooked on it now. Like I just, it's so interesting because it just made just that first episode, there was so much thought into it and it made me think about romance in such a different way. And then to go on and talk about how to develop your own romance novel and what, how that would work. I just, I love it. And like, that's now going to be my go-to. I don't think I've ever started a podcast fully at the beginning, except if I like knew that it was coming out. And so Mm -hmm. I like subscribed before the first episode released. And so I'm going to be really excited to like actually listen to a podcast from episode one. (laughs) So amazing. Well, we just really want to say thank you to Vanessa again for joining us. That was such a wonderful time, as we've already said. So we're going to move forward, but please make sure to subscribe to her podcasts, listen in, and buy her new book uh, if it's available. We'll also put a pre-order link in the show notes so you can check it out or an order link depending on when you're listening to this. I'm excited for that book. I really like Jane Eyre as a concept, but I'm really excited to read her book on it because you can really see how much she enjoys it. And I love I love when you can get someone's interest and enjoyment of it and then it can like really broaden your horizons. Oh, absolutely. And I'm I think I'm I'm really thinking I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to give it a try again because it's been so long and it's been a book that's always been kind of like weirdly in my uh, orbit just because of, you know, my the little story I told about my best friend mm-hmm. and, and ended. And, and so it's it's always it's been in my history. And so maybe it's time to pick it up and actually read it. Um, so I'm excited about that prospect. So we also have an ask of you, our listeners, which is what do you want to know from us? Because next month in June, we are going to be recording an Ask a Strumpet episode and we have an Ask a Strumpet form and we want to know what you guys want to know. And it's not too late to submit your questions. I'm really excited to get all your questions because I like talking and I'm really interested to know what you guys want to know and hopefully I have a good answer. We've got quite a few already and Yay. there's some really good ones. We still would also love to know what you want to know about Penny Royal Green um, and thoughts about that. So don't forget to submit those questions before the end of May and that link will be in the show notes. Okay, Zoe, so we've talked about June, but what are we reading next time? Well, next time, it is time. It is time. (laughs) We are going to be reading The Legend of Lion Redman, the final Penny Royal Green novel by Julianne Long. Wow, guys. This is so exciting. It's taken us almost two years to get there. Amazing. Amazing we've been doing that this long. (laughs) I know, right? And you know, it's okay. I've been putting off reaching out to Julianne Long because we wanted to read the whole series. And I'm Uh still going to reach out to her. So fingers crossed she's going to come on this show. I think she probably will. I'm not projecting at all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes, listeners, we obviously have 
always wanted to have Julianne Long on the podcast. So we're crossing our fingers that she will accept an invitation when we extend it. But that won't be the next episode. The next episode will be The Legend of Lion Redman. And I'm so excited because I have a very personal story about this book. Um, it's uh, and, and where I read this book, when I read this book, is, is quite the story. So I have been holding on to that story since we started this podcast. And I'm excited to share it. I remember you sent me a picture when you had it. Uh huh. I still remember that, Zoe. You're like, I got it. <laughs> you sent me a yes. picture of you reading it. It was great. <laughs> yeah. To Kelsey and I read this when it was a new release. So anyhow, we'll share all that with you next time. So thank you again, Vanessa Zoltan, for joining us on the podcast. Check out all her stuff. She's amazing and wonderful. And we were so honored to have her. And thanks to you, our listeners, for joining us and for listening and for all your support. And we can't wait for you to join us next time as we read The Legend of Lion Redmond. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. As like Tate. I read four last oh night. Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I just finished number set, six, six plus novella. So six and a half. And In a week? Well, I was on vacation. Ugh. You guys but have a long <laughs> flight. And so I like, I haven't read anything in like a month. And then I just was like, all the books, give me, give me, give me, give me. Nobody talked to me. I'm busy. <laughs> oh, um, and so, oh, what was I saying? Oh, and so many of them. Sorry. So I read so many romance novels, not as many as you all, apparently. <laughs> okay. No, it just happened to be. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. But um, so many of them are so cinematic.